Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, two philosophers that are radically, drastically different. But on the other hand, they share the same fundamental approach. And that fundamental approach is what is such an important contribution to philosophy and to our civilization today. Now today we know this approach as existentialism, though neither of them use that term. The term existentialism was coined by Jean-Paul Sartre much later. Sartre said that what existentialism is, is the idea that existence precedes essence, as opposed to the predominant idea of philosophy and Western civilization since Plato, which is that essence precedes existence. This is that old, old conversation about how there are universals and there are particulars. You know, Plato's forms, of course, is the ultimate example of that. Every individual tree is a particular example of the universal tree. Now, whether it's a tree or a human being, the essence of a thing defines what a particular thing is. So, if you're looking at a tree or you're looking at a human being, if you understand what the essence is, the universal tree, the universal human, then you understand what all particular examples of that type of object is. Now, this approach to the world is particularly problematic when it comes to human beings. It supports stereotypes about humans in general and groups of humans. All women are alike, all blacks are alike, all Germans, all French, etc., and so on. It leaves very little room for individuality because individuality, distinctiveness, is considered an aberration. And if you look at much of human history, including our culture today, you can see how much that approach of essence precedes existence existence and individuality has affected human interactions. But Kierkegaard and Nietzsche turned that on its head. They have the exact opposite approach. They each said that we are not defined by some higher universal definition. We are all individuals and we are free to choose our values and our choices define who we are. Kierkegaard and Nietzsche thought primarily in terms of values both a sense of moral value and a sense of what we choose to live our lives by. Now Sartre, who considered values to be some kind of imperialist tool of oppression, thought of it only in terms of metaphysics, the nature of existence. And because Sartre also thought that freedom was something fearful, something horrible, a horrible burden on us, then Sartre ran away from this idea of freedom that existence preceding essence gives us. And I think this says more about Sartre than anything else. Now Kierkegaard and Nietzsche thought that freedom was a positive thing, although it certainly wasn't a walk in the park. Now Kierkegaard was the guy who got me into philosophy many years ago. I appreciated that he was a rebel, and I appreciated that he thought for himself, and I appreciated very much that he said that all of us define ourselves. He was willing to question everything, and not in a skeptical sense, but more in the sense that we need to question in order to truly understand things. And we should look at things from many different perspectives and, and as many different viewpoints and approaches as possible in order to more thoroughly understand the things that we are experiencing. Now Nietzsche was also a great rebel, but they had different characters to their rebellion. But first let's talk about Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard and Nietzsche ushered in philosophy as an expression of the personal rather than attempts to create some sort of objective, rational philosophy. In this, they took things a step further than did the German idealists who were themselves responding to Kant's idea of the active mind and how our mind and its structures affect how we experience things and thus affect our values and choices. The idealists had talked about how individuals experience things differently. 
and Kierkegaard and Nietzsche contemplated the full implications of that realization. Now, people bigoted against religion reject Kierkegaard because, well, he was a Christian, although almost no Christians would accept Kierkegaard as one of them. His Christianity was, well, like everything in Kierkegaard, very, very radical. And that's a problem that rebels have. So few people wish to associate with them. So few people wish to say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with them. And of course, Kierkegaard, like Nietzsche, really, really upset the apple cart. Really, their ideas are really threatening to dominance, supremacy, whether it's in religion or science or politics. Now, all of that makes Kierkegaard a lot of fun, but also makes him quite agonizing at the same time. He is like that friend who, he's funny, but every now and then makes a comment that we go, Whoa, dude, that's harsh, that's, that's dark. And, and that's Kierkegaard, although not as dark as Nietzsche. We'll get into that in a second here. Kierkegaard's main concern, though, is the concept of freedom personal, individual freedom. Not a sense of political freedom, but a freedom to live one's life as one chooses. Kierkegaard railed against the empty freedom that previous philosophers had talked about, especially Hegel. Hegel's notion of freedom is, we find freedom in the full expression of the political state. Kierkegaard absolutely abhorred that idea, thought it was one of the most grotesque thoughts philosophy had ever come up with. Now, Fichte and Schelling were closer to what Kierkegaard had in mind, the concept of freedom as personal expression. But Kierkegaard realized that freedom was more than expression. Freedom was beingness. Beingness. Existence. We exist. Well, obviously, you say, of course we exist. Well, maybe. Kierkegaard would reply that your existence is so obvious that you never really think about it, and you never really think about the implications of what an existence is, what being a human being means. Existence, Kierkegaard says, means you have the freedom to choose who you are, and this means having a life of commitment. Now, most people usually ignore questions about the meaning of their lives and prefer to escape into some kind of anonymous routine. We blame television, the internet, and video games for that today, but people have always found various meaningless tasks to occupy themselves to avoid dealing with the questions of who they are and what their lives mean. People, including you, yes you, prefer meaningless routine to immerse yourself in... People, including you, yes you, prefer to immerse themselves into meaningless routine and objective reality rather than come to grips with your existence and what that means. Now everyone does this, Kierkegaard says, everyone. This goes way back, he says, and only a few brave souls have ever fought against it. In his book on the concept of irony, he argued that Socrates used irony as a tool to facilitate the birth of subjectivity in his interlocutors, because they were constantly forced to abandon their pat answers to Socrates' annoying questions. They had to begin to think for themselves and take individual responsibility for their claims about knowledge and value. And this actually is one of the most important aspects of Kierkegaard's thought and Nietzsche's thought as well. In addition to this uh, opposition between essence and existence, Kierkegaard talked about objectivity versus subjectivity. As an in existing individual being, you have no choice but to experience reality by yourself, for yourself. You are subjective. Now, we're still taught today how we must 
always take objective viewpoints. And there is value in that. And Kierkegaard didn't necessarily agree, disagree with that. Obviously, 2 plus 2 equals 4. That train is really coming, I need to get out of the way. Various things like that. But all objective truths, Kierkegaard said, must be interpreted subjectively. You yourself, in your existence, needs to subjectively interpret the things that happen to you. Now, previously I've talked about beliefs and the importance of realizing that every thought that you have is nothing more than a belief. Now, Kierkegaard challenges you not to rationalize your belief with conformities to what others are doing and these so-called objective truths that people try to get you to conform to. You have to own your beliefs. And this is another big distinction that Kierkegaard is making here. Now, we, we hear all the time, and of course we hear all the time in philosophy, about the importance of reason. And again, Kierkegaard is not saying reason is useless. But as a guiding principle, that the only thing that matters is reason, that's problematic. Because, of course, the opposite of reason is passion or emotion. If you have a belief, you have to own it passionately. And the thing about beliefs and the things that I've talked about earlier about faith, and how faith is not this dirty word or this something contrary to reason, it is something that accompanies reason. So, okay, I'm looking at the world and I'm looking at the, the, the objects of the world and, and objective reality outside myself. I have to interpret that subjectively and I have to reason about it. But unless I come to own it passionately, it's not real to me. See, true belief Kierkegaard says, is when you are committed to a belief as yours. Now, you can believe the same as others do. You can be a mindless little soldier trooping along, conforming to the objective values and ideas that your society teaches you. But if you believe and do things only because you are supposed to, that's a false belief. You have to experience things for yourselves and relate those experiences to the values you have chosen and make those experiences and beliefs yours. It is far too common in human history for us to just blindly go along to what our leaders and our groups around us tell us to believe and feel. We conform. That is dead, Kierkegaard says. Dead people walking around without passion, without subjectivity, without true being. Now, this is where Kierkegaard perhaps goes a little overboard, talking about owning your beliefs to the point of being all that matters is a willingness to die for your beliefs and cling to them in fear and trembling. He wrote a whole book entitled Fear and Trembling, and there's a lot of good ideas in that book, but it's really out there. His passion does scare a lot of people off, and I can understand and appreciate that. But, I mean, despite the guy, it was very intense, he was correct. If you do not feel and own your own subjective existence, do not contemplate the meaning of your life, and are not willing to leap into that continual struggle to know who you are and what your purpose is, how is your life meaningful at all? If all you do is watch the television and movie programs that you are supposed to, and find a lot of friends on Facebook and do what they all do, and go yay at every picture that they post, and post your own photos so you can get yay in return, that's not life. 
That's not existence. That's not thinking for yourself. It's not existence. And ultimately, you cannot escape the freedom or responsibility that Kierkegaard is talking about. Everything that happens to you is interpreted through your beliefs and your values, and your beliefs and values are chosen by you, whether or not you consciously and actively choose them. Again, if you decide what to wear, what to think, what to feel, what to listen to, what to watch, based upon what social media or your friends tell you, that's not living. You aren't creating yourself. Your life is your creation, and therefore your responsibility. Which leads us to Kierkegaard's stages of life, although I prefer to think of them as spheres. Spheres because they are progressive and expanding outward. Now, the most basic level is the aesthetic sphere. The aesthetic sphere is that life that I've been deriding and ridiculing, what Kierkegaard calls chasing after pleasure and trying to eliminate boredom. Kierkegaard would have a field day with our society today. <sighs> Social media, where the only thing that matters, well, maybe not the only thing, but certainly one of the most important things possible is how many likes I get. That's the aesthetic sphere of chasing after pleasures. Getting drunk is another one. Just going for constant experiences. Pleasures. He says that for the person within the aesthetic sphere, where only pleasures matter, where only mental stimulation matters, we are scrolling through Instagram over and over and over again to see the next thing, even though we don't really care or even know what we're looking at anymore, or going out to parties all the time, or this and that and the other thing, that's not living. It's a kind of half-animalistic existence. It's completely inadequate because all you were doing is chasing after stimulation to avoid being bored. It's not existence at all. And eventually, Kierkegaard says, you are going to realize what an emptiness that existence is, and you're going to have a crisis, and you're going to want to proceed to the next sphere, to expand your life and go to that next sphere, which he calls the ethical. Now, the ethical because you swap the constant chasing after pleasures for an existence that is based upon ethical rules, laws, really. In the ethical stage, the individual starts to make choices based upon higher truths, objective truths, if you will. Now, here the individual has the chance of gaining a history. Someone trapped in the aesthetic sphere is just going from one moment to the other, scrolling, scrolling, swiping, whatever, never really gaining anything, never having traction, never creating anything real. In the aesthetic sphere, you are just this momentary thing, almost like Hume's idea of the self. There is no self there, because it's just impressions. In the ethical sphere, you break out of that mindlessness into an idea of commitment to values. You make significant choices in who you are and the way that you are going to live your life. The problem is, is that the ethical sphere is dominated by objective ethical values. Kierkegaard derides religion as simply being stuck in the ethical sphere, as is all politics and science for that matter. 
We follow the rules. Now the rules help us. Living by rules is certainly much better than being just empty aesthetic creatures. But you cannot have any hope of discovering our individual selves in the ethical sphere. It's better than going out and getting drunk all the time, but you can't find out who you are. And that who you are above and beyond is what he unfortunately entitles the religious sphere. The religious sphere, well, we could call this the spiritual sphere, the transcendent sphere. He calls it religious, and he's has them from the 19th century, and those words, spiritual, don't really have much meaning back then. The important thing is that in the religious sphere, what the individual does is in the crisis of realizing that in the ethical sphere, we cannot hope to find ourselves and the individuality that I crave and need. We step out of all of society's structures into something transcendent. Now, for Kierkegaard, that means an encounter with the creator deity. It doesn't have to be that. It could be anything. Uh, Timothy Leary and, uh, I can't think of his name off the top of my head now, now that I'm live, I can't think of his name. But he also he talked about uh, DMT, the drug that's in the magic mushrooms. It's not Timothy Leary, he was LSD, but this other guy that I'm thinking of uh, Clarence McKenna. Clarence McKenna. DMT broadens your mind. You realize everything. You get all psychedelic, like my shirt today. You realize that there is something grander and greater than society's structures. And you interpret it, and you experience it, and you bring it in, and you passionately believe it. Now, for Kierkegaard, you encounter the living God. For Carlos McKenna, you encounter, well, reality. No, whatever. You suspend the ethical, you suspend what you were taught and what you were told, and accept something truly greater and grander than that. Fun, huh? No. Well, I don't know if Kierkegaard would advocate drug use, and of course, as a responsible adult, I wish to warn you, just say no to drugs. Don't do it. But do live life fully. Do go beyond the ethical. Nietzsche certainly did. I won't say as much about Nietzsche because he's very complex and difficult. But Nietzsche basically would agree with all of this, with except certainly not this God talk, no. Bigots against religion well, they loved Nietzsche because he hated Christianity. Well, Kierkegaard hated Christianity too, but Kierkegaard hated Christianity because he thought that there was a God, and Christianity was really throwing it up. Nietzsche thought there was no God, and therefore Christianity was really throwing everything up. Now, I love Nietzsche. It's a difficult, problematic, but I love Nietzsche. I had a cat named Nietzsche. He was a rescue cat. His owner had neglected him, and this poor cat had become rather grumpy and distant, like Nietzsche, the real philosopher. But with proper time and patience and love, Nietzsche, the cat, became a very tender, loving critter. I don't know if the philosopher Nietzsche would have ever become a tender, loving critter himself, but he does deserve more sympathy than an understanding that he usually gets. The problem is that Nietzsche is, while one of the philosophers most frequently mentioned in popular culture, like almost everything else, popular culture gets Nietzsche tragically wrong. Now, a lot of that is to be blamed by Nietzsche's sister, who perverted his works and turned them into these diatribes of anti-Semitism and proto-fascism that the Nazis, of course, really loved, and because the Nazis very, very, very strongly said Nietzsche is one of ours, Nietzsche became a dirty word, and just everything went wrong and all pear-shaped. Now, Nietzsche was negative, totally negative, absolutely. He was a cynic, but his cynicism was the cynicism of the idealist. 
because Nietzsche believed, as Kierkegaard did, that we can improve our lives, we can have a better life. And so the cynicism of the idealist who looks at the world and goes, oh God, why are you just filling it up all over the place? This is despair over how people live their lives. And fundamentally, what Nietzsche's point is, is the problem of truth. Now, this objectivity thing, I shouldn't have erased that. Objectivity versus subjectivity again. Objectivity versus subjectivity. Again, the world, our culture, our politicians, and our other leaders tell us to believe in objective truth. But Kierkegaard taught us about how we need to subjectively understand that objective truth. We need to make it ours. Nietzsche says there are no objective truths. There is only subjective truth. Truth is not something out there that might be found or discovered, truth is something that must be created. And that creative force he calls the will to power. Now this is what the Nazis perverted so horribly. The will to power for Nietzsche was not the sense of dominance. Hitler was not the Ubermensch that Nietzsche talked about. The will to power is the courage to step up and be a subjective individual. Individuality. Versus conformity. That's what it all comes down to for Nietzsche. There is no single way of structuring experience. All values and beliefs are relative to the individual. Now, as Kierkegaard would say, that it is simply choices that we make of our subjective interpretation of the absolute truth. For Nietzsche, there are no objective truths, and therefore it's a matter of just instinct almost animalistic instinct. And any other values other than these kind of subjective, almost animalistic instincts are void of value. So anything that science teaches us, anything that politics teaches us, anything that our professors teach us, void of value, it doesn't mean anything. Things only mean something if they are useful to us. And this actually is one of Nietzsche's best ideas. Truth is something that is useful to us. And something is true if it makes our lives better. And so Nietzsche even says at one point, well, could something that is completely false and an illusion be truth? And he says, yes, because if the illusion is helpful, then it's true. It's true for us. And that's the only criterion of truth there is. Is it useful to us? Does it help us? So values are created, just like Kierkegaard says we create our values, Nietzsche says we create our values. But whereas Kierkegaard thinks that there is a, a, an objective God who kind of like sets up the universe and our values must somehow align with all of that. Nietzsche says, well, there is no God. God is dead, blah, blah, blah. Uh, therefore, anything goes. You have absolute free reign. All of human society, then, is a struggle of wills in which people are trying to express their values over the values of other people. So for Nietzsche, then, how we come to truth and how we grow as individual human beings is instead of trying to find what the objective rational truth is, 
we come to an idea and we ask, is this idea useful? And if it's useful, then it's true. Now, this part of Nietzsche is very influential in the later philosophical school of pragmatism, among others. But the important thing here for Nietzsche is the need, the urgent need, for people to start grasping what he sees as this fundamental truth. We create truth, including that one, and we need to continually create truth because the world is not this objective, essence-filled thing. It is a constantly changing world, and we need to keep up with that world. So individuals need to have the ego strength, the will to power, in order to be willing to break out of what Kierkegaard would call the ethical sphere into this higher reality, if you will, not in a platonic sense of a higher reality over us, but a higher reality of more value in which subjectivity, individuality, triumphs over conformity and subjectivity triumphs over objectivity. So Nietzsche would, if Nietzsche practiced what he preached anyway, would say, hey, what, what's your idea? Let's hear it. And let's decide whether it makes sense for us or not. Let's let everyone speak. Let's let everyone propose. And if you're not willing to do that, you're worthless. Go away. You're wasting our time. If all you do is conform, you're nothing. Now, Nietzsche, Nietzsche really was that dismissive of it. If you are one of the little gray people, the gray sheep of humanity, who do nothing but conform, you are nothing. You're worthless. He detested human weakness, and he saw conformity as weakness. Nietzsche, like Kierkegaard, would have a field day with our society today, where everything is conformity, where you look, and, and I will use music because this is something very dear to my heart, uh, we are supposed to like certain pop stars, because they're on TV because they're on Spotify, because they're on iTunes. We don't listen to truly creative artists. We listen to whom the corporations tell us we should listen to. And I'm very sympathetic to Nietzsche on this point. I find that absolutely repellent, repulsive, disgusting. There is so much good music out there, but I'm supposed to listen to that crap? Yes, Nietzsche, you're right. Those, that, that's worthless, that's nonsense. The will to power is not Hitler, it's not Napoleon, it's not Trump or Boris Johnson or populism or anything like that. The will to power is not about dominance, the will to power is not about trying to control other people or conquer anyone or anything. The will to power for Nietzsche is individuality, the courage to be yourself, to do your own thing. Now, for Nietzsche, that will to power is rooted in what he considers to be the animalistic drives of humanity. Nietzsche is a contemporary of Sigmund Freud. Uh, he didn't know Freud, and Freud didn't know Nietzsche or anything like that, so that's not, I'm not suggesting anything like that. But same kind of cultural milieu in which Freud comes up with this idea that basically men want absolutely nothing but sex, and women want, well, women don't exist, so we don't care what women want. Everything is drives. Um, Adler and Jung after that, everything is drives, and then the whole uh, school of um, psychoanalysis that Freud and Adler and Jung develop and goes into just more and more this dominance of drives. Nietzsche has a bit of that, uh, perhaps a bit too much of that, 
uh, the will to power is rooted uh, in our kind of animalistic desires for self-fulfillment in a more, well, animalistic way. It's not self-fulfillment uh, as much as it should be rooted in artistic and creative endeavors. Now, Nietzsche does want us to go beyond these base urges, again, beyond Kierkegaard's uh, aesthetic sphere, beyond the ethical sphere, into some sort of, well, Nietzsche would never call it a religious sphere, but some sort of higher sphere of beingness. And that get, getting beyond the just wanting to be popular, caring what other people think, going uh, beyond just a sense of conformity, or, or, or fulfilling one's own animalistic sensory urges, Nietzsche wants us to be truly creative. Maybe he does think that we should all be artists. Now, Nietzsche kind of was. He wrote music. Uh, regardless, whatever it is that you want to create, whatever it is you are meant to create, Nietzsche wants you to do that. And this gets us to the Ubermensch. Uh, the Nazis wanted to say that the Ubermensch was Hitler, the ultimate overman. Not Superman. Uh, interestingly, true story, the guys who wrote and created the Superman comic way, way back in the 1930s, they were inspired by a English translation of one of Nietzsche's books in which the Ubermensch, the word Ubermensch, was translated as Superman. But that's not an accurate translation. The most accurate translation of Ubermensch is over. Uber is over. So it is the Overman, literally overcoming being human. Nietzsche talks a lot about how human existence is stuck in a kind of trapped objectivity, conformity, uh, lack of creativity, lack of courage. We need to overcome that. The gray sheep of humanity needs to be overcome. Very, very few people will ever have the courage to truly be individuals, to truly create. These are human beings. They lead a slave existence, slave to objectivity, slave to conformity. The overman overcomes humanity overcomes being human. Nietzsche's criticism of himself and his criticism of all of us is that we are too human. We need to transform humanity, become something new and greater. This is an idea that is popular in certain circles of futurism. Uh, transhumanism is one label that is attached to it, the idea of becoming something more than who we are. Nietzsche is the first philosopher to really take into account the, at his time, very radically new idea of species evolution. And Nietzsche says that humanity will continue to evolve, just like it has in the past. And this is the next stage, the Ubermensch, Overman stage. And the philosophers, yes him, are going to bring us into that new age. Now, Nietzsche didn't consider himself a prophet, not really, not in the Masonic sense of it. Messianics are, not in the Messianic sense, Masonics are, they're, they're, they're good five people, but Messianic as a Messiah, Nietzsche isn't the Messiah. He didn't believe that Jesus existed, which is kind of an oddity, but uh, he hated Christianity, but he didn't believe that Jesus existed. He says, you know, Jesus was the only true Christian. Because Jesus was an individual, Jesus was a rebel, Jesus overcame humanity, and everyone else is the morality of the herd. So Nietzsche sees himself as that type of person, as this overman, this person who points the way to something better. Just like Jesus did, but everyone ignored him and what he really taught. So. 
to get beyond humanity, to get beyond uh, this state that we're stuck in, we need to get beyond objective categories of good and evil. Now, this should be absolutely no surprise because, of course, if Nietzsche thinks that truth is something that is absolutely not objective, it's simply something that is useful to us, then obviously morality is simply a matter of usefulness. It's certainly not anything that is an objective truth. And because he rejects any notion of any type of transcendent being or reality itself, there is no objective anything for which morality to come down from heaven or God or what have you, or even from some sort of transcendent physics. Good and evil we are taught, objective truths we are taught to which we need to conform, 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 do what you're told. Now Nietzsche says, obviously, there are certain moral rules that just plain make sense. Don't kill each other. Killing each other doesn't really help much. It's bad for people's individual survival. And since that's really a big part of, of life is surviving, uh, yeah, uh, some sort of more or less objective universal law against murder and killing, and that's probably a good thing. Stealing other people's stuff, that's not good either. Uh, but you know, beyond certain very basic things like that, uh, things like don't have sex outside of marriage, uh, don't be gay, uh, don't like that music, or what have you, that's just stupid, Nietzsche says. That's, that's mindless conformity to objective truths that don't really exist. So, to just overcome that, just have to think for yourself, so to, to go into the world boldly and say, look, I want to live my life, and I want to live my life according to values that I choose. And if I don't see values that, that I like, I'll create my own. I'll create my own life. That's the over, over man. That's the Ubermensch, not Hitler, not Napoleon, not Trump. It's any of us. It's simple, really. Except that's the most difficult thing in the world. To be yourself should be easy. And yet it's so difficult. Maybe because we have to put up with all those humans who are still all too human. Now Nietzsche and Kierkegaard, though everyone kind of wants to dismiss them, certainly the power structures find their ideas and philosophies necessarily just really abhorrent because it does speak truth to power. They are very influential. So much of how we think today is influenced by this. But it's not kind of influenced in that kind of um, undercurrent, the undertones of subculture and society. And I'm not being as creative and overmensch about this as I should be at this moment, but I think when you look at not what popular culture is, but what subaltern cultures are, or what the creatives are doing, that's more of what Kierkegaard and Nietzsche are getting at, especially Nietzsche. Uh, some have said that probably one of, uh, one of the people who Nietzsche would consider an ubermensch would be like Pablo Picasso. Uh, kind of a detestable human being in certain respects, especially his treatment of women. But Picasso was someone who created, and he didn't really care if people liked or disliked his work. Uh, he certainly didn't care about conforming to conventions. Salvador Dali would be another. Uh, just, I paint what I feel, I do what I want. And so that's the gift that Nietzsche wants to give us, is this notion of being something more than simply human. And whether you take this idea of you are an individual rather than a simple conformity to social pressures, and take it in terms of a Kierkegaardian sense of 
attaching yourself to a higher truth or a Nietzschean sense of, well, there is no higher truth, so I'll make, make do. Uh, finding your individuality is very important. And if there is one message that I wish to say in all of my philosophy videos and all of my philosophy lectures is that. Think for yourself. Spend the time and effort and have the courage to really throw yourself into learning things, experiencing things, enjoying life, and creating a being that you are proud to be. Create your own thoughts, create your own values. Listen, learn, and create.